Mr. Harvey Richard Norris and Miss Doris Pearl White, a lovely middle-class couple, joyfully welcomed their baby boy Wendell Warren Norris into the world on November the 23rd, 1945, in Roswell, New Mexico. I don't know about you, but if your name is Wendell, you either become a victim of severe bullying or a psychopath, which, in this story, the latter is the case. As we dive deeper into this video, pay close attention to the transformation of his physical appearance, from a normal, cute all-American boy to a deadly gang leader who instilled terror in his enemies. Quick rundown on the evolution of the Aryan Brotherhood if you're not too familiar with this prison gang. The Aryan Brotherhood's origins are traced back to its reported founding at San Quentin in 1967. However, before this faction emerged, various other gang affiliations existed. The Chicanos celebrated their indigenous heritage, while the black population focused on their African roots. The white convict community drew influence from Nazi, Western Irish, and outlaw biker cultures. Many gangs including the Diamond Tooth Gang and the Bluebirds paved the way for the Aryan Brotherhood. These prison gangs evolved over time, with members from different groups uniting to establish the Aryan Brotherhood. Now back to the hero of the story. On September the 19th, 1971, at the age of 25, Mr. Norris, along with Alan Wright Munro and Michael W. Lee, escaped from the Tehachapi Minimum Security Prison by jumping a fence. How easy! On the way, they took Mr. Richard Babcock and his wife hostage, threatening them with makeshift knives, and forced them to drive to Bakersfield. The couple were ultimately released unharmed and promptly reported the incident to local authorities, providing detailed descriptions of the escapees. Law enforcement caught up with the men at the Greyhound station, resulting in Mr. Norris facing additional charges due to his escape attempt. This marked the first of several escape endeavors for him, solidifying his reputation as an escape artist and a high security risk for any facility housing him. His lust for violence and evasion strategies made him notorious. Imagine him as a Houdini, but instead of tricks, he's got a knife and a strong desire to make you disappear, literally, if you mess with him. On January the 29th, 1974, exactly at 12.55 a.m., a Folsom guard caught Norris outside his cell in the prison's maximum security section. Prisoner escaping! Quick! Quick! Where? He was caught red-handed, soaring through the bars of a window that led to the exercise yard. Further investigation revealed a hole roughly one foot square in size, cut through the bars and screen of both Norris's cell and that of Daniel Kenneth Cuomo. By the way, Cuomo had attempted an escape the prior fall, so they were like escape buddies, if you will. By January the 1st, 1976, Norris found himself housed at the California Medical Facility in Vacaville, following a failed escape from a Solano County jail on October the 30th, 1975. His wife, Carol Lynn, and her friend were captured during his October escape attempt, charged with aiding a prisoner's escape, but shockingly, they denied the charge. During a visit on January the 1st, Miss Kathy Kettles was subsequently arrested after guards discovered drugs and weapons in her possession, including suspected amphetamine and codeine pills. But hey, she was just trying to help a brother out. On February the 27th, 1976, his younger brother, Chucky Lynn Norris, Norris followed his big brother's footsteps and received a prison sentence of five years to life for his involvement in the armed robbery of Bears Market in Chico. Interestingly, Howard Rawlinson, his partner in crime, happened to be the brother of Danny Dog Rawlinson, another member of the Aryan Brotherhood. What a small world. Chucky's public defender strongly urged the court to consider sentencing him to county jail instead of the California Department of Corrections, where his older brother held a leadership position in the Aryan Brotherhood. This was mainly due to the huge risks he would face there as a family member of a gang leader. Norris wrote a pretty elegant and extensive letter to the court trying to say his little brother, Chucky. He asked the court to avoid sending his brother to a state prison and took responsibility for his brother's criminal actions. Norris described life in prison as a constant cycle of fights based on race and daily battles to stay safe. He mentioned his own ability to navigate this environment, which made him a leader in the Aryan Brotherhood. Norris also emphasized the risks his brother would encounter as gang fights often resulted in revenge against friends and family members. Did the court grant him the wish? I don't know. I wasn't there, so go figure. In 1979, Norris found himself on parole, freely moving about the San Francisco area. On January 
January the 14th of that year, he committed a fatal shooting, taking the life of Guillermo Rodriguez near his house. The prosecution's argument suggested that the homicide occurred in the course of a drug-related theft. According to Norris and his partner in crime, Robert Donahue, their intention that evening was to exchange a sawed-off shotgun for heroin at the Rodriguez residence. When he noticed the gun on the table, Norris took that as a threat from John Rodriguez, who Donahue recognized as a member of the rival gang, Nuestra Familia. Norris armed himself and, by accident, discharged the shotgun, taking Guillermo Rodriguez's life. Following a trial, he was convicted of second-degree murder and received a sentence of 19 years to life in prison on May the 21st, 1981. But guess what? On the way from Folsom State Prison to Solano County to be prosecuted at the court, Norris pulled a Houdini again and executed a daring escape. Shackled and closely guarded, he took out a hidden small gun, a 22 caliber revolver, and effectively made the officers give up their guns and took control. Show them who's but, 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 Deputy Brightwell reacted quickly to the situation, zigzagged the vehicle to disorient Norris, allowing both officers to escape. So, how did this car drama end? Again, I wasn't there, but hey, don't forget to subscribe. Wink. <laughs> what I can tell you, though, is that after that incident, the Aryan Brotherhood changed. They went from a setup where everyone made decisions to one where a group of leaders called a council and commission decided things. The most important people in this new setup were obviously our friend Norris, Robert Blinky Griffin, and Robert New York Crane. On October the 13th, 1980, in an incident branded as killing for the brand, Norris and Junior Schneider took the life of Stephen T-Bone Gibson in Chino Palm Hall's Aryan Brotherhood Mexican Mafia Yard, or ABMA for short. Gibson succumbed to two fatal wounds from the stabbing. He was attacked because he talked smack about the Mexican Mafia. And you know what happens when you disrespect the Mexican Mafia, terrible consequences will follow. The time between late June and early July 1987 was really bad for the Aryan Brotherhood. They called it Hell Week. Most of the bad things happened in CSP Sacramento, which is next to Folsom State Prison. On June the 22nd, 1987, inmate Art Rufer, a member of the Brotherhood, was housed in Folsom Prison's beef facility. During an altercation, Officer Pitts, who was observing the yard, detected a flash from Rufer's hand and immediately recognized a weapon. He shot Rufer, who was about to stab another inmate. After this, things got tenser. On July the 7th, 1987, Paul Corbett Schneider stabbed correctional officer Carl E. Krupp and officer Pitts, who had shot Rufer, barely got away from being killed on July the 8th, 1987. And here's the kicker. Robert Ryan Rowland, an ex-Aryan Brotherhood member, revealed that the attacks were orchestrated after receiving a note from none other than Norris, the Brotherhood's leader. Norris allegedly ordered the hits against law enforcement. On April the 7th, 2003, Wendell Blue Norris, at the age of 57, met his end through self-inflicted stab wounds to the chest in Calipatra State Prison's gym. An improvised weapon, a seven and a half inch piece of sharpened metal, was discovered at the scene. You know what they say, you live a violent life, you die a violent death. Hashtag poem by me.